Uh, yeah, I have a dead body here. Harriet's laying in Ashton, please. What happened there? I don't know, but it looks very nasty. See, she's been strangled, I think. Do you live at this address, or you visited this address? Uh, 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 it's my ex-wife. She's got a cord around her neck. Okay, all right, we're going to get police on their way, and obviously we'll get ambulance as well to, to check. Um, she's cold. She's dead. What's her name? Sharon. And her surname? Birchwood. The killing of Sharon Birchwood was one of the most complex investigations ever undertaken by Surrey police. A woman with no enemies and no criminal connections, brutally murdered in her own home in a seemingly professional manner. And quiet, leafy suburban Surrey, not exactly the kind of place you'd expect a murder. Of course, the real thing is anyone hates her, and there is nobody. No one would hate a girl like that. She's not that type at all. This was a most unusual killing, and the trail would lead detectives unexpectedly from the country lanes of affluent Surrey, halfway across the globe, to find answers hidden in the back streets of Thailand. The manner of the murder was very different to any that I had seen in the past. I've been given exclusive access to the police tapes for this complex case. They reveal the skillful combination of interviews and forensics, which uncovered the clues Sharon Birchwood herself had unwittingly left behind. It was one of the toughest cases I've had, because what people will stoop to when it comes to murder still surprises me. It was unreal. This is Harriet's Lane. This is a lovely part of Surrey. This doesn't happen here. The quiet village of Ashted in Surrey has been shocked by the murder of a local woman in her own home. 52-year-old Sharon Birchwood had been suffocated. Today, the lane where she lived was cordoned off as police hunted for evidence. She was a vibrant, energetic, wonderfully bubbly, enthusiastic person that everybody wanted to be with. She was my best friend as well as my sister. Who would want to kill her? I felt incredibly sad because she died in terrible circumstances. So that again makes me more determined to make sure that whoever is responsible it goes to prison for it. What followed was an extraordinary investigation into what seemed at first to be an unsolvable puzzle which had been left by the killer. These hours of police tapes reveal every twist and turn of the case. They show how police played a clever strategic game to make sense of this brutal and baffling crime. When Sharon's body was found in December 2007, Lead investigator DCI Maria Woodall was one of the first officers on the scene. The calculated nature of the murder suggested to her that this was not a typical crime of passion. The signs in this murder were not the usual signs mm -hmm. of a domestic yeah. murder. It certainly wasn't the sort of domestic murder you would normally come across. She was covered in clothing and blankets. Why did somebody do that? What was the need? She had her ankles bound and they were tightly bound. She had her hands bound and pulled up towards her face. And then they'd gone further. They'd then taken an electricity cable and actually used that. They'd been meticulous in, in making sure that Sharon actually died. So what did that make you think about who might have done it? It could have been a stranger. Whoever's done this doesn't think we're going to catch them because Sharon didn't actually know them. So when we start to look at her life, we won't find that person that easily. I'm on my way to meet Sharon's sister, Lauren, who lives a few miles away in the house where she and her sister grew up. Did the police tell you how she died? I was told that she was strangled, which was her worst nightmare because when she was born, she was born with the cord round her neck. So that just threw me completely when I was told she was strangled. I just wanted to 
well, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was just completely and utterly devastated. Nobody deserves that. Nobody deserves to end their life like that. And her, more than anyone that I know personally, I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but she just was such a giving, kind, loving, caring person. You know some people, when they walk into a room, it lights up and everybody turns around and looks at them. That was Sharon. She loved people. She had lots of friends and good friends, people she made friends with were generally for life. I was quite close to Sharon. She lived across the road, so it was a dreadful, dreadful shock. It was unreal. This is Harriet's Lane. This doesn't happen here. She had a wonderful laugh, a wonderful sense of humour. She was just a lovely, lovely person. So desperately sad that the way that it, um, that it ended for her. At this early stage, the police only had one witness. Sharon's ex-husband, George, had discovered her body and called 999. He came in voluntarily for questioning. Give me full name, please. I'm George Bertrand. OK. I need to get information from him as soon as possible to see what he'd seen. This chap was deemed to be a significant witness, which means that they have information that we think will be really beneficial to the inquiry and will help the inquiry. Tell me everything that you can about what you remember. I entered the property, no problems. I walked into her room and then uh, and then discovered her in the bed. She was cold, very cold. So I just went straight out of the room and phoned 999. Uh, and waited for the, the ambulance people to arrive, and then the police. You OK? Yeah, I'm OK, thanks. And um, I don't think you need me to say anything after that, do you? You don't, in your lifetime, expect to come across somebody that you find having been murdered. So he had been through a pretty traumatic incident. Is there anything else that you can think of that you think might be useful for us to know? Of course, the real thing is anyone hates her and there is nobody. Okay. No one would hate a girl like that. No. Okay. She's not that type at all. At this point in time, I've got the whole team on this investigation because it's a stranger murder. We didn't know who had killed Sharon. You have to find out as much as you can about Sharon as the victim to piece together her life so that you can identify when she was last known to be alive. We had house-to-house -house inquiries going on. We had CCTV trawls going on. We had a forensic strategy around Sharon's home. We also had a forensic strategy around Sharon. At the heart of the mystery was the crime scene. Police needed to know if this had been a burglary gone wrong, but it was hard to see if anything had been stolen. I remember going into the house quite vividly because there were so many things in all of the rooms. There was no uh, obvious point of entry, forced entry to the premises. You couldn't tell whether anything had been stolen because it was such a mess in the house, but it would appear that there was nothing worth stealing. Our minds were working overtime saying that none of this makes sense, none of this makes sense. The unusually cluttered home also created problems for the forensics team. The big challenge is you've got to be the, the treasure hunter to find the one single piece of evidence that's going to prove the case. You have to imagine if you were carrying out this offence, where are you likely to leave some forensic evidence? While the house was searched, detectives started piecing together Sharon's life and relationships through the people closest to her. George knew an awful lot about Sharon, Sharon's life, and he was an integral part of that life as well. So he was potentially the key to discovering who murdered Sharon. Perhaps now's the, the right time to sort of give me an understanding of the relationship you've, you, you have with, with Sharon. How often you, you, were you visiting Sharon in recent weeks? Uh, four times a week. You 
were together for about 10 years and you separated in about 87, 89. That's about right. Okay, and, and you got divorced sometime in the 90s? About mid 90s, I would okay. guess. It didn't ever end, really, is the truth. We're best friends. Um, perhaps you can tell me more about her friends who visited. As far as actual friends are concerned, I think her sister is the one that she's closest to. Uh, and what's she called? Lauren. Did she want the marriage to come to an end? No, not at all. She was completely devastated. There always seemed to be a very strong bond emotionally with her husband. You refer to him as her husband. But they divorced. Yes, they were divorced. But she never, ever acknowledged it to any other person on the planet. This sounds very complex. I mean, a very unconventional, complex relationship. She used to go round there nearly every day. And in her mind, they were still married. They were still a couple. There was still a chance that they were going to end up together. In the police interview room, George was telling detectives everything he'd witnessed at the scene of the murder. There's no sign, I don't believe, as I didn't look, of it being frenzied, but it looks frenzied. Someone who's a bit disturbed. It was quite, I found it quite horrific. Working carefully through Sharon's house, forensics concentrated on finding DNA, hoping it would lead them to a suspect. The first priority was around the masking tape used to bind Sharon and the electrical cable that was wound around her neck. Potentially we've got the DNA and fingerprints to identify any suspect who may have contact with those because that would clearly link them to the murder. To restrain Sharon and tie her up is quite a strenuous bit of activity and therefore it's likely that the suspect would have been sweating and aggressively handling that tape and therefore potentially likely to have left some DNA behind. While the tape was sent to the lab for DNA testing, the police collected routine samples from George. We also took your DNA with your consent and also fingerprints and all that sort yep. of thing. Yep. OK. In these early investigations, George seemed to be volunteering everything he knew about Sharon's death. But as he coolly revealed his unusually close relationship with his ex-wife, he was beginning to arouse suspicion. It sounds an old cliche, but in my experience, the person who's found the body is either just a passerby, or somehow they know more than they let on. It's just gut feeling that something wasn't quite right. He knew something. In Surrey, police were looking for a suspect in the mysterious murder of Sharon Birchwood. So you're okay still? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks very much. Their most important witness was her ex-husband, George, who found her body. But police were becoming convinced that George was more involved than he was letting on. Detectives needed to keep him talking, without him realising that they were starting to suspect him. You're happy to carry on? Jeez, while well, my brain's going, I'm better off. Keep on going? I think so. Do you have a particular strategy? You build up this rapport with them. He thinks that he's, we're his friend, which is what we want, because without the trust, we're not going to get the information that we, that we want. You're doing very well. The memory is it's not easy. He became very friendly and told us all about his business interests and how he was an entrepreneur of this and, and, and an entrepreneur of that. George got involved in all sorts of spurious businesses in strange countries. Cambodia and Thailand and basically anywhere that he thought he could get a business started. Beneath their friendly approach, detectives were circling around key questions designed to unlock the mystery surrounding Sharon's death. It was obvious it was a murder from, from the outset, so you've got to look at a motive. Sharon, does she have any life insurance at all? Oh, yeah. Yes, she has. Yes, she's got life insurance okay. on that £62,000 mortgage. And do you know if you should have made a will? I believe there is a will in the house. Okay. But of course, handwritten will like that, I don't know how legal it is. And what does it say? Everything's left to me. Everything's left to you. The tactics worked, 
and George willingly revealed a strong potential motive. And you help me out financially where you're at at the moment? Financially, I'm... Are you in debt? Oh, yeah, I'm always in debt. Well, that's me. To the tune of what? In total? Maybe approaching 100 grand. It's not good, anyway. My position isn't good. It never is. Um, okay. I, I spend money too quick. Okay, George. OK. So... I knew that that house at Harriet's Lane was probably worth about half a million. So you don't have to be Helen Mirren to work out that there's a potential motive growing there. How significant is it? Very significant. You've got financial problems. So that's the first thing we think of, there's a motive for a murder. Does he turn at this point from a significant witness into a suspect? I wouldn't say that would make him a, a you know, to go up to a suspect straight away. It gives him a motive, but we don't know what other people that may have a stronger motive. Bear in mind, this is only a few days after. Mm. There's still a long way to go to link him to the murder. Absolutely, yeah. Presumably you wish to see me again tomorrow. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Police now needed to work out if George really had killed Sharon. They were waiting for DNA results, but they still didn't know exactly when Sharon had died. I knew immediately that Sharon's time of death was going to become very critical to discovering who had killed her. If you don't have a specific time of death, putting a suspect in the crime scene at a particular time becomes more difficult because it's more open-ended. When Sharon's body was discovered on Friday the 7th of December, it appeared the murderer had taken deliberate measures to confuse police and disguise the exact time of death. What would piling clothes on top of her body do to the body? I think that they were trying to slow the cooling of Sharon's body because we'll look at things like rigor mortis. I think they wanted to frustrate that so that we would find it very difficult to pinpoint the time she died. Unable to name the time of death from the body, the team looked for other signs. Inside the house, investigators discovered the clutter of Sharon's daily life might hold the clues they were searching for. She was definitely a hoarder. Bus tickets, train tickets, receipts, wherever she went, she would have kept every single piece of paper. Almost obsessive, really. I didn't realise that her sort of eclectic nature would actually give me the key to discovering um, when she actually died. There was lots of silent indications around the house that would indicate the day of death, particularly because they just stopped at a particular time. The diary which Sharon used to tick off things to do, and they were all ticked off on the third, and only one was ticked off on the fourth. There was a particular entry she'd put into a TV choice magazine about the things that she was going to watch, which only went up to that date. A neighbour also saw Sharon walking home from the bus stop on the afternoon of the 4th. But it was during Sharon's post-mortem that the last piece of the puzzle was discovered. We found a torn postage stamp in her hand, which had been pulled away from an envelope. You know, the fact that this was still sat in her hand at the point at which we examined her allowed us to speculate that the point at which Sharon was attacked, she was going about her normal daily business. <laughs> The stamp came from a letter delivered on the 4th of December. Detectives concluded that Sharon was murdered late on that Tuesday afternoon, shortly after she arrived home. They immediately needed to know where George was at that time. I just want you to, to talk me through and expand upon your movements. Um, I walked over the road, wherever the lights were green, could have been anywhere, to get into the Ashley Centre. Just looking in windows just for Christmas, you know. And you drove straight home to your, to your mother's? Yeah. He told us that on the 4th of December, he'd been in a shopping centre and that we would probably find him on CCTV. So police trawled through hours of footage from the area where George claimed he'd been.
And eventually they found the evidence that showed George could not have killed his ex-wife. Sure enough, we found CCTV putting George in the shopping centre in Ashstead at around about the time that we would say that Sharon was being murdered. The CCTV confirmed that when Sharon was being killed, George was four miles away, window shopping. I felt pretty <laughs> terrible. I pretty felt cheated at the time. We were certain he actually did the murder. But the CCTV proved that he, he couldn't have done because he couldn't have been there and in the Ashley Centre and here, there and everywhere. Then more evidence to rule George out. DNA test results came in. Genetic material found on the tape used to kill Sharon belonged to an unknown man, not George. Police now knew it wasn't George who had killed Sharon. When it became clear that he couldn't have possibly physically done it himself, all my instincts and my feelings had gone out the window. Maybe I was getting, getting slow and maybe I picked up the wrong things. Are we looking at this bloke when we should be looking at somebody else? In November 2007, police were hunting for a killer in suburbia. Their prime suspect was the victim's ex-husband, George, but CCTV proved he'd been Christmas shopping when Sharon was murdered. The senior investigator, DCI Maria Woodall, studied the footage. She wasn't convinced by what at first seemed to be a watertight alibi. What strikes you about how he appears in these shots? Well, for somebody looking at him just amongst the people, you wouldn't think anything unusual of it at all, but to me, he's making sure that we'll be able to see him. What would you expect to see on the CCTV? Well, I'd expect to see a lot different than that. I would expect to see somebody buying things. You know, this is coming up to Christmas time, but he doesn't actually buy anything. He's giving himself an alibi for the time that she was actually being murdered. You then go off a, a different angle. You've got to look at a different angle. At that time, when I, I felt that there's got to be somebody else involved, it's more than one. Police now wanted to know who George had been in contact with around the time Sharon was murdered. They asked him for his mobile phone. Right, so you use that motor road of incoming calls. That is basically my mobile phone. And it's used for incoming and outgoing calls. George was a witness, so I would expect him to tell us as much information as possible. He knew the purpose of us looking at his phone, and that purpose was to firm up his alibi. George was happy enough to talk through his call history, unaware he was wandering into a trap. We did extensive work around who was calling him, I noticed that there were a significant amount of calls from a number that George hadn't previously told us about and, and you know, who that person actually was. For us, that was a big red flag. You've got no phone calls from this number, rapid and frequent activity just before her murder and then nothing after. But detectives were careful not to alert him to their suspicions and kept the tone friendly and informal. Can we just clarify, first of all, your phone book? Who's on your phone book? You mean the contacts in this phone? Yes. What were your tactics when it came to asking George about this unusual phone activity? During this interview, we asked him about a number of um, telephone numbers that appeared on his records, and we sort of filtered in the one that we were interested in. We wouldn't go straight to that number. We'd build up to it, which is what we did. 8160. That's actually Sharon. And why did you do that? Because if we went straight to the number, that would put, it, it would put him straight on the guard that he would know that we know something about his particular number. Police took their time before they finally introduced the suspicious phone number. 56049. Right, recently I've had two friends here from Thailand. Okay. It would be one of those. So who are the friends from Thailand? One's called Paul. Paul, and what's his other name? I don't know. 
He's he's actually a friend of a friend, really, isn't he? Yeah. And is he is he Thai or is he English? He's English. He's English. Our tactics of being friendly, open, and honest started to pay off because he's now given us a name. He's given us a country. He's given us something else to go on. And how long did he stay? Two weeks, ten days. And where, where did he stay? He stayed in London, he stayed with me, he stayed... Whereabouts would he stay with you? Well, my mother's. Drawn in by the police, George readily admitted that someone was staying with him around the time of Sharon's murder, a detail he'd failed to mention in hours of previous interviews. He also casually revealed he'd taken Paul to visit Sharon at home, just days before her death. The hairs on the back of my neck went up because I thought, a friend that's come over from Thailand and it's been in Sharon's house and you've taken this long to tell us about it. I remember a real buzz in the, in the room. We'd clearly been looking for an unknown male to link back to our crime scene DNA profiles. And through the interview with George, we'd now identified a potential unknown male by the name of Paul. That was on the Friday before. On your own? No, that was when I took Paul there. All right, Paul, don't think I meant. As police pushed for more detail, George's knowledge of his friend Paul suddenly seemed to escape him. So you can't help us out with the, his surname at all? No, I could probably find that out. You can find that out for us, OK. He knows his Paul. He doesn't know his second name. And yet he's staying with his mother. Mm -hmm. I mean, either he knows him really well. Or he doesn't. Or he doesn't know him really well, in which case, why on earth is he staying? Mm -hmm. Is he your friend? You've got to push each time for him to get that information out. For me and the team, this is a major moment in the investigation, this volunteering of this person. Who is Paul? Why did he suddenly come and, and visit George and stay at the home with George and George's mum? What was going on there? As police interrogated his account of Paul's visit, they realised that after hours of interview, the way George was acting was also revealing valuable information. What do you notice about his body language? Yeah. When he tells you the truth, he's very open, his, his eyes are wide and he's, he's quite happy to speak. And, but when he's lying, I learnt this over a period of time watching and being in his company, his body language changes, he'll squint his eyes, he'll furrow his head like that and you can tell that, that what he's telling you is not the truth. Right, so how did he just walk out the front door? And... No, no, no. It seems to me when he seems to be revealing perhaps more than he'd want to. Mm -hmm. He's literally got his head in his hands. I took him somewhere, didn't I? Maybe thinking, thinking am I doing the right thing? Yeah. Dropped him off at the station. I dropped him off at the station. He's got his head in his hands and he's just thinking, what do they know? What station? Sir? I'm trying to remember. I think it could have been Morden. I think I drove him to Morden as opposed to Banstead. It could have been either. George claimed he only knew Paul's first name, but police were now desperate to find out more about the mysterious visitor. First, they scoured local CCTV and found footage of George's mother collecting an unknown man from a train station around the date George said Paul had arrived. Lo and behold, there's a perfect, absolute perfect picture. There's a mum at the top of the stairs and shaking hands with him. Detectives knew his first name and now what Paul looked like, but they needed more details. Paul had actually stayed at the house with George and George's mum. So I asked George for permission to go into his home and look for any evidence that would tell us who is Paul, what was going on there. Forensics scoured the house and made a crucial discovery in the bathroom. We found a fingerprint on a glass that was in the bathroom in the bedroom that he'd stayed. The glass was innocently on the little shelf in the bathroom. The glass was sent to the lab for forensic analysis. The fingerprint, we got a hit against um, a historical um, fingerprint database search on a chap called Paul Crine. 
and I think that match went back to 1972. Paul John Crine, aged 23 and with an address at Middleton, appeared charged with robbing £10,000 belonging to Barclays Bank. Luckily for us, Paul had been convicted of that offence of robbery. He'd given his fingerprints. That was an amazing moment. We actually had a name for our suspect. Luck does play a big, big part in any investigation, and there is an element of it in it. A friend of George's stayed in a, a spare room at George's mother's home, had used a glass and it had never been cleaned, which subsequently was identified as being attributed to Paul Crine. Police now knew Paul Crine's identity and history, but the only way to place him at the crime scene was to match his DNA to the traces found on the tape used to kill Sharon. And this presented a problem. When Paul was in the UK and committing uh, offences here in 1972, we didn't take DNA from suspects. The only way to obtain Paul's DNA was to find him and get hold of a sample. So how would you contact him now if you had to contact him? Through someone else. Who's that? A um, mate of mine in Thailand. Uh, Paul, this Paul's back in Thailand now. He's either in Thailand or Cambodia. As soon as we had the name, we had a way of, of then trying to really tie down where Paul was. Now, George had initially told us quite early on that Paul had come over from Thailand to visit him. So that's where our inquiries then took us. Unexpectedly, the murder investigation now shifted from suburban Surrey to secretly collecting DNA from a convicted criminal living 6,000 miles away in Thailand. He was mentioned in uh, Pattier and places where I know that are notorious for the sex trade, uh, drugs, a lot of criminality, uh, expats are out there. The investigation team was divided up as officers attempted to track down the man that they thought was a murderer. Internally, it was covert. We didn't know that officers had gone out there as a team. That's the way they work here. There's certain things that we don't need to know because I'm in close association with George, just in case he told Paul Crime. I made contact with the embassy out in Thailand and I worked with a man called Barry Kenyon to help me track down Paul Crime. The photographs of Sharon Birchwood, I think it's fair to say, were very gruesome. I thought that if I could play some role in either clearing or incriminating Paul Crime, then I felt it was right for me to do so. They had to identify um, where Paul Crime was living, what his patterns were, so that they could find an opportunity to be able to secure his DNA. The investigation at, at that moment in time hung on securing this DNA without Crime knowing we were there. Barry invited Paul to meet for lunch on a false pretext. If he came, the team might succeed in getting the DNA they needed. It was a carefully laid plan, but with no guarantee of success. We met in the Café Royale, lunchtime. There were the two Surrey police officers, and there were also a couple of Thai police officers in plain clothes at either end of the street, just in case something went badly wrong. Paul had a sandwich he was very fond of talking about himself. He claimed a presence in the Guinness Book of Records for having the longest underwater swim with a snorkel, I believe, ever recorded. I looked in the Guinness Book of Records. I don't know if it's still current, but he did hold the world record for uh, swimming underwater. He exaggerated to such a degree the good sides of his personality that he did make one a bit suspicious, to be honest. The officers had to recover that DNA and get it back to the UK for analysis without Paul Crime even knowing they were there. As I recall, there was a knife, fork, a spoon, a plate, perhaps the remains of a cheese sandwich. Waiting for a DNA result to come back is really tense. You're waiting for that phone to go. So the whole team were on a knife edge. Deep into a murder investigation and British police were now in Thailand, waiting for DNA results that might prove an expat with a criminal past 
had travelled 6,000 miles to murder Sharon Birchwood at her home in Surrey. Forensic work was done and it was confirmed that the DNA from a tape that was used to bind Sharon matched with what we had on the cutlery from Thailand. Oh, it was amazing. We knew we had the right man. We knew who had killed Sharon. Paul Crine's DNA matched the only DNA found on the tape used to bind Sharon's face, hands and legs during her murder. It was proof he'd killed her, but police still didn't know why. I knew at that point that there was no connection between Paul and Sharon. There was no motive for Paul to kill Sharon. So we then needed to find out whether George had arranged for Sharon to be killed and why he'd arranged for her to be killed. Police were certain that George's mother had no involvement in the murder and the investigation turned back to Sharon's Surrey home. Searching through Sharon's life in that house, we found some of her sort of jottings on bits of paper about her feelings for George, about what happened in those days prior to her murder. One of the jottings said, are you hoping that I'm going to die so that you can use the insurance money to sort out your mess? Voice from the grave, very chilling, very sad. So George became a suspect and the decision was made to arrest him. Nearly a year after Sharon Birchwood had been found murdered at home, her ex-husband George was arrested for her murder. Up until that point, we'd treated George as a significant witness. We'd been gentle with him. We'd interviewed him at his pace. Now the tables were turning. George was a suspect. I just want to confirm that you understand that today you've been arrested on suspicion of murder. After months of careful evidence gathering, Police were now ready to confront George with the proof that they had uncovered. I'm just going to ask you your explanation what some of these perhaps might mean. Yeah, Sharon's jottings would be very hard to answer, God. Are you hoping I'm going to die so you can use my insurance to sort out your mess? She's not saying I was hoping, she's saying am I? Throughout these jottings, there's a theme about getting rid of her. Well, I disagree with that. There is no theme about getting rid of her. Can you tell me what, what that, that is, then? Well, I, I don't read it that way at all. I know Sharon. Did she say these things to you? She would write it. Then when I came in, she'd read it to me. I did treat her accordingly. There's no doubt about it at all. I think Sharon was right. That was what George was plotting, which was a key part of our evidence. Detectives then wanted to challenge George on his motive for arranging the murder. There was a huge financial incentive for you to kill Sharon, and you enlisted the help of a known criminal. You were involved in Sharon's murder, even if you didn't yourself physically murder her. Is that the case? No. Whether he actually did physically committed the murder is irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. This man here, was complicit in every way you can think of. And he's sitting there thinking, you can't touch me because I've, I've committed the perfect murder. There's no evidence, you can't prove it. It's quite nerve wracking because you know that you're now gonna re reveal your whole hand. Whatever you put to that person, you have gotta be able to make sure you can back it up properly with evidence. George refused to admit any involvement, so police made their final move. They presented him with bombshell evidence, linking George to Paul Crine, the man he said he barely knew. It's always a, a bit of a cat and mouse game, I think, with an interview. And sometimes you, you keep a trump card up your sleeve. He would only say that he knew Paul as Paul. We'd done an awful lot of work to show that we believed that not to be the case. We confronted him with the fact that we'd found an email whereby he'd used Paul's real name. It proved George knew the full name of Paul Crine and that he had arranged for him to come to Britain to commit murder. But George still tried to deny all knowledge. There's forensic evidence at the scene, George, which implicates Paul Crine in Sharon's murder. His DNA profile has been found on the tape. So it's in or something like that. That he's used to bind Sharon. Have you got any comments to make about that? No. 
that was probably the only time that, that George didn't have an answer for anything. I have no idea how I got there. We started to apply the pressure by telling him exactly what had happened to Sharon, to try and evoke some sort of response from him. Sharon was murdered by strangulation, and she had an extension cable wrapped around her neck. It's a very unusual method by which to kill somebody. Please, I don't wish to talk about it, OK? It is a very unusual method. Yes. It was very nasty, and I was exceedingly upset about it. Yeah. She didn't die immediately. I know that. I'm not stupid that she suffered. Mm -hmm. And please, I don't really wish to talk about it anymore. Please, can you keep it to questions that are necessary? He got quite angry at certain points in the interview. But, you know, sometimes that's a good thing. I think a jury, if they're watching the suspect's interviews, might take that into account. I'll ask you some direct questions then, Yes, George. please. Did you kill Sharon? No. Did you witness Sharon being no. killed? Did you in any way assist in Sharon's no. murder? Wait, can you wait until I finish the question to you answer? Did you conspire in the killing of Sharon Birchwood? No. Do you know who murdered Sharon Birchwood? No. Did you have prior knowledge that Sharon was to be killed? No. Have you got anything else to say? Yes, yes. let's say it's all nonsense. Everything I've just said is nonsense? Everything. Okay. He still accepted no responsibility for what had happened to Sharon. We may never get him to realise that we consider him a murderer, even though he didn't actually physically do it. The time is 21.50, and we'll stop the interview there. What do you think happened to Sharon on that Tuesday? I think for Sharon, it was a day she'd been planning. It was in her diary. She was going to go shopping in Guildford. George let Paul into the house and he waited then for Sharon to come home. She got off the bus, she walked up the lane in through the back of the house. Paul was waiting for her in the bedroom. She put her coat on the back of the door, shopping to one side. She opened the Christmas card from her mother. She tore the stamp off of the corner of the envelope. And at that moment, Paul has hit her. And I believe at that point that she was probably unconscious because she's never let go of that stamp. He's laid her on the bed. He's bound up her legs. He's then strangled her using some electrical cable. Paul piled up clothing on her. And then he's left the house, left Harriet's Lane, made his way to Heathrow Airport. From that moment, Paul Crine's um, objective is to leave the country as soon as possible. Their whole game plan was to make sure we didn't know that she was murdered on the 4th. If they could shift it so that we thought it was the 5th, Paul Crine would be out of the country. And putting the clothes over her body to yeah. muddy the time of her death yeah. means that he thinks he's also giving himself an alibi. Yeah. To me, this is, a, this is a business transaction. This is a job for him. He was a contract killer. He's going to get paid. He's come across, met up with George, done what he's needed to do, and he's back on the plane out of the country. It was the ultimate, wasn't it? It was them throwing down the challenge for us to catch them out. And I think the way they viewed it was that we were stupid. We wouldn't find the mistakes they'd made. Paul Crine was extradited from Thailand. He declined to speak to police before appearing in court. Each of them maintained their innocence, but both men were found guilty of the murder of Sharon Birchwood and each sentenced to life with a minimum of 32 years in prison. In my view, the way they killed Sharon was barbaric and the sentences reflected that that was the case. So when the sentence was delivered, oh, I couldn't believe it. It was incredible. It was, in a way, it was like, yes, justice has been done. Why didn't he do it himself? 
because he couldn't, could he? He didn't have enough grit to actually carry that out himself. He was quite happy to plan it and manipulate, which was what he was good at, and get someone else to do his dirty work. They went out of their way to try and frustrate us, and at the end of the day, uh, they didn't manage it. You're the only person with your team that can get answers for the family and those people left behind. We will continue until we get what we need to get justice for the victim. Mm -hmm.